Hey guys, it's Alex Powell here with another episode of the Real Estate Leadership and Legacy Podcast. Today, I have a really special guest, Matthew Frederick. Our conversation today is excellent. We are talking about a new game he's been developing for high school kids and with some exciting projects that he's got in the U.S. as well as here locally in Ontario. So you do not want to miss this episode. Stay tuned. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Leadership and Legacy Podcast. I am joined today by a amazing investor and someone who I'm proud to call a, a good friend, uh, Matthew Frederick. Matthew, thanks so much for, uh, for joining me. You know, I'm super happy to be here. Always super happy to be with you. That's amazing. Amazing. So for you guys who don't know Matthew, I got a bit of a bio here I'd like to share with you guys. So Matthew Frederick purchased his first investment property in 1984. That was at 13.7% interest. Along with experiencing six market adjustments over the past 40 years across Canada and the U.S., he knows how to navigate today's market. That's one thing for sure. Through a residential one to four unit, multifamily 12 to 64 unit, self storage, land development, and now ADUs, Matthew has the actionable answers that you seek and enjoys helping investors scale up. And to that last point, I can attest to that fully because you were a, um, a big motivation for me as well to move uh, part of our business processes into the U.S. And I, I remember when you and I were working through some stuff there, so that was awesome. So I was hoping you could maybe um, give us a, a kind of a brief outlay from the beginning. Like what got you started in, in real estate like, or entrepreneurship? I, I've heard a bunch of your stories, but I'd love if you could share with our audience, like what got you into this? Well, you know, um, I was born in Trinidad and Tobago and, you know, I came here at seven years old. So being an immigrant, my parents told me I got to work twice as hard to get as far. And my parents expected something of me. So I couldn't just do the basic life. I had to, you know, I, I had to justify the fact that we moved our lives to Canada. And mm -hmm. uh, so therefore, by the time I was 16, I opened up a business. I would drop off these cookbooks to um, offices and I would just... I asked the receptionist to sell them for me. You know, I'd tell them I'm a starving student and I'd buy these things for $4 and sell them for 14. You know, they retail at uh, about 18, 19. And, uh, you know, as a 16, 17, 18, 19 year old, I was making around like 20K a year. An adult would make about 28K. And these are cookbooks because I, I refused to drop off newspapers. I, I, I didn't like it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so you know what? I'd saved up. And by the time I wanted to buy my first house at 19, um, I bought it pretty much at 50% uh, down. And uh, my parents came in with a bit of the mortgage. And back then it was like seventy five, eighty thousand dollars for for a two family home. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how I got started in real estate. That's amazing. Yeah. So you were just a hustler from the get go. I love that. I love those stories. You can kind of envision it like as a movie one day where you're just going and hustling the uh, you know, uh, cookbooks and stuff like that. So that's amazing. So, so you bought your first property. Was that then converted into a rental property or was that a property where you house hacked or what was your kind of strategy and what helped you kind of scale? So that property I house hacked because, um, you know, I was 19 and the basement apartment had a separate entrance, but it had no kitchen and I didn't have the money or the knowledge to put a kitchen in there, but it already had a washroom. So what we did was we actually shared the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So I call it house hacking because my unit was first floor, second floor, and the uh, half unit because it was an okay. old Victorian home. And the basement was the rental unit and they had access to the kitchen. I had access to the kitchen. So that's pretty much what I did. But I was not an investor. I just wanted to own a house. And mm -hmm. about four years later, so from 19 to about 24 and a half, I didn't invest. I just learned to manage that tenant. And we had about two or three tenants and I went through a lot of crazy stuff, especially because I was living there. But yeah. my brother came to me at 24 and a half. By that time, I was already a teacher and he convinced me to invest in real estate. Like I didn't want to do it. So he kind of pulled me into it because I'm a systems guy. Mm -hmm. And then him and I, he was a police officer in Hamilton. We started buying properties together. So we do a buy, fix, sell, buy, fix, sell, take that money and use it as down payment and fix up money for a buy fix rent. And we do yeah. two buy fix sell, buy fix sells. 
you know, back then a house was about $130,000, 125000 So it wasn't super expensive. And, uh, but that's what we did. Two buy fix sales to buy one to hold. Two buy fix sales, buy one to hold. So we, we always bought at about, you know, 60% financing, right? We had 40% in there anyway. Never mm -hmm. had an issue with uh, max, maxing out the dollar, right? That's an amazing approach. I feel like a lot of folks have probably gotten spoiled as of the last, call it, I don't know, eight years or so because appreciation has just been skyrocketing. And they probably didn't realize that you'd have to do those kind of sequential moves in order to scale up and build your portfolio. Nowadays, you know, you put a kitchen into any, or create a, a basement unit and you're refinancing, you'd be able to pull out 100,000 equity. And you could just roll that into the next one. You're skipping the step of having to do the buy, fix, sell, buy, fix, sell, then buy, fix, hold, right? Yeah, that's very true because you can remember in the late 80s and early 90s, the interest rates were 6.5%. Mm -hmm. So it's not as though they were like 2009, one, two, three, like one or two percent. Not to mention yeah. when you bought a house and you fixed it up, even if you put $100,000 into it, appraisers were very, very conservative. Yeah. They're not going to double the value of what you put into it. You're lucky yeah. to get a bump up. And then banks frowned if you were to buy the property and then come back and refinance it. Banks didn't want you to refinance for about two years. They frowned against that. So, you know, the Burr process, the, the speed of it, as of 2009, properties are going up 15% on their own. Mm -hmm. Ours are going up 6%. You fix a property up, you could jack the price up on it. That wasn't happening in my day with appraisers. And interest rates were like 6%, not like 2%. And banks were not allowing you to refinance that fast and pull money out. So just, just, just a different time, a different time. For sure. Do you think that like on the, on the interest rate uh, standpoint, I mean, you've, you've gone through some pretty remarkable corrections and booms and busts. And I mean, you've, you've bought and experienced Alberta. So you obviously yeah. know how volatile that market has been in the past. You've, uh, you know, you've done stuff in the, the U.S. all over in Belize, uh, you know, you've got, yeah. so we might have to do a couple of videos just to get everyone up to speed on what you've done. <laughs> but what's your opinion right now on, on interest rates? Because especially like during, you know, the Volcker era where everything was like my parents, for example, they bought their first property at 21% interest. Yep. You know, and that was uh, right when I was born, roughly. So you look at that and now you look at like this major decline in interest rates where for the longest time we've been buying at, you know, 2% interest, nothing. And now things have shot up to like this six, six and a half percent interest, right? Do you foresee that interest rates because of things like technology and reporting is more efficient? Do you think that interest rates will keep hovering there? Or do you think that there is speculation that we could go up to some drastic uh, interest rate again in the future? Well, two things. Um, so as you mentioned, I bought my first house in 1984 at 13.7%. By 1989, it was up to about like 20, like, like, like 19 to 20%. What, what year were you born in? 88. 88. So 89, 90, that's when your parents bought their first property. Yeah. Um, okay. So here's the bottom line. You, you know what? I thrived in 7 or 8% interest. The only mm -hmm. difference is my projection of um, success or my timeline for results was different than as of 2009. In 2009, you buy a house, you want to pull money out within a year. You want to see cash flow within a year or two. You want success within one, two or three years. Mm -hmm. In my day, five years to success was okay. So when interest rates go high up, what has to modify is the person's expectation for wealth. Mm -hmm. How soon can they get it? In today's world, everybody wants everything now, today. That has to change until rates go down again. Yeah, rates will go down again. Mm -hmm. I don't know how low they'll go. Maybe they'll stay around 3.5%. It's possible. It just means that somebody has to get more investment money to put down mm -hmm. or be able to do more lump sum investments, buy, fix, and sell, get a chunk of change, put down 30%. Yeah. I mean, people used to get mad at me for me leaving about 30% equity in my properties and people with like no experience, two years experience, for instance, which is great for some people, 
turn to me and say, wow, you're not bold, buddy. I lived through yeah, the I survived. market. <laughs> I burned. I burned. So it's not about being bold. It's about having that equity in there. So when mm -hmm. everyone's burning down, you're like, time for me to buy. Uh, That's that uh, 110% <laughs> was Kaylee and my saving grace is uh, we didn't choke up our properties so high that we were like breathing through a straw. And so when, right. when things changed, it was like all of a sudden, like we have, of course, like, you know, during that time you're hurting, cash flow's hurting, right? You have properties that are negative in their cash flow, but we had enough, like more than enough to, in our coffers to sustain that kind of a tidal wave that kind of brushed over. And now it's interesting. You you look at a lot of these like very successful, prominent real estate investors who maybe have popular YouTube channels or anything like that, and they're all saying like the time is now. Like get ready and like they're licking their chops because they say that the biggest wealth is created during these like downward up momentum's. Right? Yeah. It's very difficult when to plan those when the bottom is going to be, when the top's going to be. But you can tell now even in the real estate, like generally speaking, with the amount of time that homes are sitting on market that things are lagging, right? This, people aren't excited as they were a few years back about real estate. And as soon as interest rates come down, people are going to see possibility again. People are going to get excited again. Supply is going to be a, a big, a, a big topic of conversation and the lack thereof. So it's very interesting. It's so true. And what happens is you get to a point where everybody believes you could make money in real estate. And the people who were sitting on the sidelines, the people who, you know, were very fearful, they generally get to a point where they lose their fear and they jump into the market. But they jump into the market without understanding it and they start buying things for prices higher than they should have. And sellers end up selling for property, selling properties higher than they should. And that's usually when the market's about to collapse. Then when it collapses, those folks run back away and say, I knew I should never have got, I should never have gotten into the market. Yeah. And that's usually when the person who's in there for the long haul can come on in and get some super good deals. Mm -hmm. So that generally, I've seen that happen about probably four times throughout Alberta, BC, uh, the U S and Canada. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, it's fascinating. I feel like during the last few years, I've gotten like a minor in economics just from <laughs> truly understanding this. It's, I think it's a, a healthy thing to go through this. A healthy, if you're, you know, you've done things to insulate your investors and yourself for that matter. Yeah. Um, not so healthy if you're uh, screaming, kicking the screen on the way down to the fiery pit, <laughs> but uh, I get it completely. I want to talk about a couple things that you've, uh, some exciting things that you've got in the cooker right now. So um, you had been talking to us about a game that you've created, which is really cool because I think we need more of these kind of games, very similar to like cash flow by Robert Kiyosaki. You're saying that you're created a game now that's meant for kind of high school students to give them an idea on, you know, but actually, you know what, I'm going to let you explain the whole thing. <clears throat> well, you know, every year, every summer I teach a, a five day class for high school students um, on business. In other words, mm -hmm. how to create a business from scratch, how to present it, how to organize it. And then, um, you know, uh, the winner, I give them money. Right. And, you know, I've started about 12 businesses myself from Thai food restaurants to colon clinics, to senior day center, to a number of other businesses. You know, I even had about 12 little bank machines, little ATM machines in, um, variety stores. Right. So, you know, uh, in order to teach this class, uh, one, one of the opportunities I created this game, it's been about probably 30, 40 hours to create it. I call it God's dice. And what it does, it puts them through uh, three scenarios in life. Scen mm -hmm. Scenario number one, wheel number one is part-time work. Wheel number two is education, going through higher education. Wheel three is skilled labor. That's more of a track, track four is more to do with de degree type of education. Mm -hmm. And then the major track going around is um, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business owner. And then I create about uh, 95 situations that happen in categories. So a category would be uh, expenses. And I go through all expenses from car expenses to 
you know, whatever expenses you generally pay in, in your life, I have 20 expenses. And then we mm -hmm. have opportunities, things that can go right, opportunities that they can choose to take. Uh, we have assets they can buy, whether it's houses, whether it's uh, cars, whether it's TFSA, RSP, 401ks in the US, obviously, RESP, and uh, GICs and stocks. And then we go into change because in life, change happens and these change cards puts them in a situation and it gives them a chance to live the life of if they're a if they're a skilled worker but they want to be a business owner or mm -hmm. they're a, a, a degree worker but they want to be uh, a skilled worker so they get to experience different lives as we go around this game and at the end of the day it's not who gets the most money it's who gets the most money and also life credits and life credits are given for, you know, doing things um, that are more to do with work-life balance as opposed to just money. So I created the game. I tried it out. It was amazing. Um, the kids were laughing. They had a great time. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm most likely going to uh, go to the next level and make this a great board game. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. You'd let me know when that's ready. I will buy it. I'll be your first customer. I will gladly buy that. I got a, you know us, we got kids coming up the ranks slowly into, you know, before, before long, I'm sure, you know, getting into yeah. high school, we plan to be doing a lot of this kind of financial education stuff with them, yeah. especially like, you know, cash flow quadrants, that kind of thing. It's uh, very, so very important. important. So important. And I cover 95 things that, you know, really educates them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I was, uh, you know, Erwin Zito. I know. Erwin. Yeah. Yeah. So I was golfing with him. Um, uh, about a week or so ago and we we're talking about kids he's got kids that are now in their their double digit age but they're still young enough uh you know my kids my oldest has just turned five right so we're in just a kind of a little di difference but i was talking to him i was like so what are you doing to you know teach your kids about you know financial responsibility that kind of stuff and of course they have things in their life that they set up that are just rules that they go by and how they reward certain things with their kids. But he said, one of the most important things is actually showing them chari doing things charitably. So yes. they have the basket brigade, for example. And so he said, one of the most impactful things was when he brought his son to deliver presents. And, you know, he saw like how someone else lived and what someone else got for Christmas versus what they might have. So, you know, it's one of these eye opening things that I'm really hoping to, well, not hoping, I will be intentional about it when the time comes to introduce our kids to that, to teach them about financial responsibility and, and then to teach them about abundance and then eventually how to give back because I think that that cycle is very important, you know? Well, I think that's important because even in the five-day workshop that I do for these uh, high school students, uh, one morning we take them to an old age, a senior's home, and they talk to seniors and perform for them. Next day, we actually go to a food bank and we literally have them put together boxes and packages uh, for people at the food bank. So what, what you and Urban, Urban were talking about makes so much sense that uh, I think kids need to go through that process. I hope you keep doing this thing because uh, we'll be enrolling yeah. the boys when they're, when they're ready to join. Yeah, let's, uh, let's get into some other fun stuff too. Um, I want to hear a lot more about your ADU business. Um, so why don't you take it away? Yeah. So during, you know, during COVID, I created a business that went out there and it fogged, killed the virus at large companies, um, you know, uh, you know, change rooms, right? You know, mm -hmm. large companies, change rooms. Uh, so COVID happened, I took advantage of it. Uh, Bill 23 came about. So as a business owner, I took advantage of that as well. So mm -hmm. I created a company, a system, and I'm looking to bring a few shareholders in uh, as partners. Uh, that uh, what we do is we actually manage the process. I've gone through 12 different cities and I understand their bylaws inside out for additional dwelling units, tiny homes. And I've gone to 12 different companies. A number of them make these from scratch. A number of them make them from C containers, modular. A number of them make them modular from uh, wood. I've analyzed and I've chosen the best of the best. And I've put together a system where I go out there and I talk to uh, property owners and show them why a tiny home can benefit them, whether it's a little bit of extra income, whether it's for extra family, maybe a senior can live close to home still, have their autonomy, young mm -hmm. adult, uh, you know, young professional. 
Uh, so we actually find the people, let them understand that their backyard is working for this. And then we actually manage the process of the feasibility study to see if it's possible. We manage the permitting process. We manage the oversight of the company who's actually building. We don't build. Uh, we manage the people putting in the services, connecting the services to the ADU. We manage the delivery if it's a... Um, uh, a modular build, and then we manage, uh, you know, any additional things that's going around. So it's really a management company that uh, we, we, I bring my years of building. I mean, I build subdivisions, 113 house subdivisions, and I build four story, 50 unit condo buildings. I'm not talking about a simple ADU in the backyard. So mm -hmm. we bring that power to the table to help the average everyday person through the process because most people who are doing ADUs are home renovation guys, or they are developers or builders who have, yeah. need some extra money, or people who just want to get into it. And they're going to run into a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to cause a lot of money for homeowners. So I figure, why not solve a problem? So you can yeah. see, I jump into the breach to solve a problem, take advantage of Build 23. That's why I created that business. No, that's amazing. Amazing. So, so effectively, it's like a in a box. Here you go. If it, you're going to assess if your property is yes. uh, can handle it, of course, it can comply with all the the particular bylaws of that city. And then you guys say, oh, we've got model one, two, and three. You guys pick one, and then boop, we put it in, and it costs X amount of dollars. Right. And then we we do the permitting. We do the we oversee the company who builds it, mm -hmm. and then at the same time we oversee. The difficult stuff, like putting in the services. And we get paid for that. We get paid mm -hmm. by the property owner for that. And we'll get a commission from the whoever we bring as the person who's going to build that actual unit. Amazing. So we're not tied to a unit. So we're able to be a, a, a dispassionate third party watching the process. If you build great, we're on your side. If you build mm -hmm. terrible, you got to go. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love it. I love it. Yeah. How's the how's the overall market reaction being? Because you can appreciate with these kind of and this being the issue with the garden suites and the tiny homes is the the nimbyism. You know, not in my backyard, yeah. right? So, have you gotten any sort of pushback on that? Is what's the general market sentiment for people who might be interested in, in getting involved in this kind of thing? Yeah, so I haven't received too much pushback for not in my backyard, but I can see that being a problem. The biggest problem mm -hmm. being how do you finance it? And right now, people just extend their HELOC, right? Mm -hmm. Or if they have a lot of equity, they just re rework their mortgage. Um, so that that's an issue. Mm -hmm. The biggest issue is how do you sell these things? How do you actually talk to people and cause them to want to put one of these in the backyard? So I spent some time developing a process um, in order to make that happen. It's what to say and how to say it. Uh, and it's, it's, it's taking me a little bit of time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. But again, that's what I do well. I, I, I'm able to find off-market deals that are not for sale and do business with them. So therefore, I ported that ability into what to say to people at the door to cause them to actually want to do this. And I, I already have about three people where we're doing feasibility studies I started this like business full time uh, August first, and when I say full time, I'm going to be training people to do this, but I'm still going to be involved in that whole training process. Amazing! Yeah, very very cool, very cool, yeah. awesome. And so you know, it wouldn't be without saying that you've got your fingers in all kinds of other other you know areas as well. So tell us what's going on out in Dayton. You yeah, got so some exciting stuff happening out there. Yeah, so I'm building a um, 144,000 square foot uh, three-story self-storage mm -hmm. building. It's going to be about 850 units of all different sorts. We're going to combine that with an office. So there's there's rental office space. Uh, when I say rental office, I mean on a daily on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So daily office space. It's going to be a it's cafe like there. Space. Yeah, it's going to be a cafe. There's going to be someone there to accept uh, packages or deliver mm -hmm. packages or to send out packages. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be uh, a little space for in case you want to have uh, wine storage. It's going to be climate controlled for wine storage. And uh, also, if you have clothing that you want to store in the wintertime uh, or you want to store summertime, 
uh, there, there'll be a place to put clothing for storage. So it's like a one-stop shop because there are a lot of small businesses that they keep all their stuff in the garage, all mm -hmm. their products in the garage, and the garage is not climate controlled. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you can put it in a spot where it's climate controlled, you got different business owners coming and going. You have a cafe, people are talking. Uh, you generally get a good dynamic, and it creates um, it creates genius when you spend time with other G business owners. For sure. So, For so sure. That, that's what I'm creating down there. Yeah. So, uh, w if you don't mind me asking, what's something like a three story self storage unit in terms of the land, the purchasing, the renovations, the operations, do you have any sort of rough figures at this point? Yeah, yeah I do. I mean, for us, because um, I wasn't rushed into this. Mm -hmm. In other words, I was talking to a landowner two years before. Um, what it was is a family who had six properties and they were all, let's say, not so great, but they were all uh, in, in a zoning area zoned for self-storage. Mm -hmm. And this family was fighting amongst themselves on what to do. And ultimately I came in there and I was a voice of reason. In other words, it was not about buying the land. It was about if you sell your land, what do each one of you want to do? Like mm -hmm. one person wanted to go to Arizona. I have property there. I have connections there. One person wanted to go to Florida. I have connections in Sarasota and Cape Coral. Another person loved the fact that we were building in Belize. So I provided solutions for the family so what would normally cost, let's say, $1 million for a piece of land, I would have got it for about $900,000 or probably eight fifty. dollars mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is I was able to get a discount by solving the problem of building a long-time relationship. And because I wasn't dying to buy the property, uh, I wanted it, but not that much. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I had super negotiating power. And then when it comes to the actual construction, I have a company down there who... Uh, they build these things for a living and pretty much uh, I can do anything between 150 and 175 a square foot because it's not as though we're building a condo building here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so again, and then raising the money because I have access to uh, my portfolio, which is a series of joint ventures, happens to be multifamily buildings that we bought from 2003 to 2000 and let's say 17, happens to be uh, 12 to 64 unit buildings. I'm more able to borrow against the equity and then use that as my, my, my money to get uh, the land and the site plan approval. So I didn't have to go to anybody to get land money or site plan approval. And now that it's site plan approved, looking pretty good, now we're able to go to the banks. Now, I have family who lives down there who, is, uh, who are citizens, and therefore they're the ones who are getting the U.S. financing. Awesome. I have to be very mindful of what I say I'm doing in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm not licensed in the U.S. to do any kind of physical work. Mm -hmm. So all I'll say is I'm thinking and somehow my thoughts are translated <laughs> to the people that I know who are actually doing the things that need to be done. Because we have to be mindful that we're not doing work in the U.S. Yeah. without the right paperwork. Mm -hmm. So through osmosis, through thinking, <laughs> that's wrongly the, thinking. That's the law of attraction. I love it. Things oh, are happening. So in terms of you're not being able to, let's say, work in the U.S., you're just talking like you're not there physically doing the planning and getting paid through the U.S. You're just there as right. consulting family members who are helping you. Does that translate at all to when people here locally are buying like and doing flipping properties and stuff like that? Well, technically, a Canadian is not supposed to go down to the U.S. and do any work on a property because you're taking work away from an American. Yep. And if you drive down there with your tools and they ask you at the border, what are the tools for? And you say, well, I'm going to do a little bit of work on my property. They're going to stop you. Mm -hmm. So technically, a Canadian is not supposed to go down there and actually do any work there. Right now, sometimes I fly down there and I will on vacation and I may pass by the property, right? But ultimately, I'm not physically doing anything there myself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now, just... do people do that or don't they do that? I don't know what people do, but I just know that the rules are pretty clear. You're not supposed to go down there and do the physical work yourself and mm -hmm. take jobs away from Americans unless yep. you have made that uh, known to the government. Well, as you're very well aware, when you and I were initially discuss discussing and I was planning to go into the U.S., 
when yeah. we bought our places in Columbus, it was sight unseen. We had never mm -hmm. met the agent, never met the wholesaler, never met the contractor, never met the plumber or the electrician, yeah. anybody. And uh, it was all done virtually like this or through a cell phone yeah. where I'm sitting there talking to somebody. Exactly. And, uh, and it was actually a beautiful thing. Yeah. Having done it that way, I could never imagine me having to pack up my crap, drive out to Columbus to go hammer nails or whatever or paint walls you know when you can do that all so conveniently with the technology we have nowadays you know and that's very true and guess what there are people down there who can do that and it's not as though they're super super expensive so mm -hmm. why not just be the brain to a certain degree as a and use technology as opposed to going there yourself and spending all your time there right so is this eventually something you guys are going to be doing like a large capital raise for uh, well, in this case, yeah, we already raised the capital ourselves, like um, my partners down there and myself. Mm -hmm. We just took our own money mm -hmm. and we pretty much uh, now are just going to go to the bank and get the financing to finish the, the project. That's so this was not a capital raise in a sense. We just mm -hmm. went internally into our system and uh, did that. I was looking to build something out in London, a 100,000 square foot warehouse, and we were looking to raise or have somebody raise with us about $12 million. Uh, that didn't work out because the, um, the final value after we got the appraisal, we didn't get the bump we needed. Mm -hmm. We could have tried to build it, but at this stage of the game, it's not worth trying something. Uh, you know, why not just do something that can work? Yeah. In a down market or a tricky market, it's not a time to explore experiment. Yeah. And it's the first one we were doing. So the first one has to work because it becomes the, the, uh, the prototype that you can build on and say, hey, because I did this right and on time, this is why you can give me money for my second, third, or fourth. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to try this out you know, against the wind and then it not work well even if we got it done and now we could not use it as a prototype for raising money because it would not have been efficient. Yeah. So I decided, okay, we put some money into it. I put a lot of time into it, by the way, because I, I had about $6 million committed. It, it is my project, so I can raise money for my project. It, uh, verbally, uh, well, as a, um, you know, a, a, a letter, letter of intent. intent. Yep. But I had to go back to my people and say to them, nope, I'm not going to risk your money. Uh, we're not going to do this. Some of them were pissed because they were really into it. But you know what? It's not going to go and do that. I don't need to do it and fail just to get it done. And my partners were in agreement. Amazing. Yeah. Well, you've got some very, very exciting things happening right now. In terms of uh, like next steps for you, in terms of the ADU business, let's say, or in terms of any of this, when, when do we expect to see things rolling out so that we can, as potential consumers, when can we learn more about these things? Well, basically, the ADU company has started. And like I said, I'm going to pull together a few shareholders. I'm going to raise a few hundred thousand dollars just so that I can put my time into it um, and not take on a mentorships. You know, mm -hmm. this year I haven't taken on any, any new mentorships. Every year I mentor about 12 people. I keep it small, keep it simple uh, because I'm busy, right? I'm busy mm -hmm. doing my real estate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but for me, so the ADU company is now rolling the game that I talked about. I'm at the point now where I'm about to talk to a game company. And when it comes to the um, a project in, in the US, yeah, we're actually looking to break ground soon. Um, now, keep in mind that I'm 59 years old and I've been in the game for 40 years. So technically, I should have retired about six years ago. So I'm not looking to build a massive empire. You know, I'm looking to just have coast. fun. <laughs> yeah, coast. And I, I've been coasting since 45 years old, but sometimes my coasting is faster than other people's, let's say, running. Mm -hmm. And then compared to some other people, my coasting is very, very slow. Yeah. I mean, I've been hearing about these guys who have bought 405 houses and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Guess what? I'm not into all that. Yeah, well, I just coach. we also I just know coach. where they're at right now, too, some of those guys. But yeah, yeah. anyway, yeah. I, I will say one thing about you, Matthew, is that um, I can attest to your breadth of experience. And I, th I think that you are, uh, like your background is also in teaching, right? You started yes. like 
teaching folks. So I think that the way that you explain things, and we've had you speak at GAIN on a number of occasions, like, you know, I've mentored with you as well. So it's been a, a very valuable experience as well. And I find that you're also someone that like generally can, can, uh, can, come to terms or, or can find the similarities in your own life experience to what someone else might be going through. Like when we're going to the U S or we're planning to do something, whatever syndicated deals. I know that's, that's like our next big focus is like buying larger properties that we have to pool money in. You know, these are things that you've done. So for those of you guys listening, if you guys want to check into, to uh, Matthew a little bit more, Matthew, where can, where can people get a hold of you? Well, you know what? They can grab uh, my email. It's Matthew with one T, so M A T H E W dot F at R C C S O L dot com. If they want to see some of my guest appearances, because I think the best way to know somebody is just to listen to them. Mm-hmm. And I've done about maybe 40 of these interviews, and mm-hmm. that's located at R C C S O L dot com slash podcast. And uh, what you said is, is important in the, in, the, in the fact that uh, being able to speak. Mm-hmm. I've been able to raise money for my projects because I'm able to speak to people and not just speak to them, not to promise them something, but to educate them on why I'm doing what I'm doing and uh, meet them at their level, whether they're a higher level than I am, even to myself or even at a lower level, I'm able to meet them at their level and listen to them. So therefore, you know, like when I say to you, I mentor 12 people in a year, six of those people are mentoring are how to raise money, how to speak, yeah. because you're always going to need money. My entire life of real estate investing, I always needed money. <laughs> it's a never ending thing, right? Yeah, for sure. You know? For sure. Well, I love it. And I, I know I've benefited from it. And one thing I will say is that we are kicking back gain to consistently once a month, starting in September. Once a so month, okay. with, with that, we'll talk, but I'd love for yes. you to be one of the folks that comes out to chat with our, our group. Well, so. I, you know, I look forward to it. And, uh, you know, you said a few good things about me. I really appreciate that. But I got to tell you that uh, you guys are amazing to me as well. You're steady. You're like the North Star. You know, I've watched you guys move from point A to point B. You, you've done amazing things at distances that people would never even consider doing something. So. You know what? Uh, I am equally impressed with your abilities and what you've done. Uh, and I kind of wish I was a, as efficient as you are sometimes. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it very much. Well, cheers to you. Thank you so much for, for uh, coming on the show, Matthew. And honestly, uh, we're going to have to do this again because I'd, I'd love to, to share some of the updates of what you got going on. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I'll let you know. All right. Thanks, guys, for joining me on today's episode of the Real Estate Leadership and Legacy Podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and please check out some of our other videos. We've got an abundance out there. We've got a lot of great insight and information, and we'll see you guys on the next one.